on World News Tonight. Conservatives for the win. Greek elections drew to a close with Kriakos Mitsotakis being re-elected for a second term as Prime Minister. Wagner halts revolt. Russian President Vladimir Putin met the Belarusian president to discuss the Wagner uprising in Moscow amidst US's claims of his weakened authority. Meeting of the Prime Ministers. Modi signs partnership with Egypt's president Abdel Fattah El Sisi. And our packers win hearts. Tokyo residents find comfort in fluffy, street-strolling alpacas. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News this Monday night. We're commencing today with the latest developments of the heated Wagner Mutiny. The Russian President Vladimir Putin held talks with his Belarusian counterpart over the weekend over the Wagner Group's rebellion against Moscow. And Washington says Putin's leadership is being threatened. After Wagner fighters had captured the Russian city of Rostov and came within 200 kilometers of Moscow, tensions de-escalated on Saturday as peace talks began. Citing Belarusian news agency Velta reported that Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke with Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko for the third time in two days on Sunday. The talks come as Lukashenko apparently brokered a deal with the leader of the Wagner militia group to end a rebellion. In exchange, the Wagner group halted its approach to Moscow on Saturday and instead withdrew to Belarus. And despite saying that those who had taken part in the armed insurrection would be punished, as part of the agreement, the Wagner chief will face no action from the Kremlin. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Sunday that the brief mutiny by Wagner shows cracks in Russian President Vladimir Putin's role as a leader of the country. So I think this is clearly, uh, we see cracks uh, emerging. Uh, this has been a devastating strategic failure for Putin. Uh, across virtually every front, uh, economic, uh, military, uh, geopolitical standing. China also responded to the weekend's unrest, saying that it continues to support the efforts of the Russian leadership in stabilizing the situation. China's foreign ministry went on to add that the recent escalation in tensions in Russia was Moscow's internal affairs. Meanwhile, according to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. has decided to keep current sanctions against the Wagner Group in place. This comes as the U.S. was initially going to add more sanctions against the militia group in relation to an ongoing mineral-related business in Africa, but that has been put on hold. Experts say the U.S. doesn't want to appear to be taking sides, making it clear that Washington does not support either the Russian government or the Wagner Group. In high summer temperatures, China has entered another diplomatic busy season. Welcoming Barbados's Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister Oyuni Rudene of Mongolia, New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins and Vietnamese Prime Minister Pham Minh Chin. Hosting partners of the Caribbean and the Oceania and two neighbours of Asia, China stands ready to deepen relations and enhance cooperation with countries across the world and hopes to inject momentum to post-pandemic global recovery and collective development through its opening up and modernization. New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins arrived in Beijing for a visit to China. At the invitation of Chinese Premier Li Chang, Hipkins is paying an official visit to China from June 25th to June 30th. He will also attend the meeting of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting of the new champions known as the Summer Davos Forum, which is said to be held in North China's Tianjin municipality, alongside other world leaders, including the Prime Ministers of Barbados, Mongolia and Vietnam. The visit is Hipkins' first to China after he became the Labour Party's new leader and was sworn in as New Zealand's Prime Minister in January 2023. On the other hand, the Prime Minister of Mongolia arrived in Beijing as well. China and Mongolia enjoy a strong relationship. Last November, Mongolian President Ukna Kurlesuk visited China. In talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping, both pledged to work together for a shared future of peaceful coexistence, solidarity and win-win cooperation. China and Mongolia have agreed to expand cooperation in key areas including the economy, trade, energy, mining and infrastructure. Furthermore, they have agreed more coordination on the environment has been called into focus again this year as both countries faced a brutal sandstorm season over the spring. 
Now, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi signed a partnership agreement with Egyptian President Abel Fattah El Sisi on the second day of his visit to Cairo. During their talks, Modi and El Sisi discussed matters on education, renewable energy, as well as boosting trade and Indian investments in Egypt. The spokesman of the Egyptian presidency said in a statement. The two leaders signed a joint declaration to upgrade the bilateral relations to the level of strategic partnership. The statement has also added that PM Modi, who is on his first official visit to Egypt, extended his invitation for Egypt to participate in the upcoming Group of 20 meeting in New Delhi. India, the world's second largest wheat producer, banned wheat exports in May 2022 to help control rising domestic prices, rescinding a plan to export 3 million tons of wheat to Egypt in the year 2022 and 2023. Egypt now now depends mostly on Russia for grain. Greece's conservative New Democracy Party stormed to victory in a parliamentary election with voters giving reformist Kriakos Mitsotakis another four-year term as Prime Minister. An ambitious plan to transform Greece. Kyriakos Mitsotakis wasn't short of targets in the immediate aftermath of his re-election as Greek Prime Minister on Sunday. The Conservative incumbent saw his centre-right New Democracy Party triumph in the polls, giving him a second four-year term in office. Today we will enjoy our victory, but from tomorrow morning we will once again roll up our sleeves and begin together to build a strong Greece, a nation with more prosperity and justice for everyone. Thank you again for the honor. Tomorrow dawns an even better day for all. The 55-year-old Mitsotakis is a former banker and scion of a powerful political family. He's promised to boost revenue from the vital tourism industry, create jobs and increase wages to near the European Union average. He's also vowed to push ahead with reforms to rebuild the country's credit rating after the debt crisis which racked the nation for a decade. Speaking on Sunday, voters had cited a range of issues they wanted the new government to tackle. I'm certainly waiting for the new government to do what hasn't been done for the last four years. Things that will benefit the youth, that will encourage them to not move abroad. I'm expecting a lot, but the main priority is healthcare as well as the economy, so we can live decently as things have been difficult. I'm a pensioner. I was in the fire brigade, but now I don't have a penny. We want our lives to be better and for our children to find jobs and stay in Greece. Sunday's vote was the second in the past five weeks. A first poll on May the 21st held under a different electoral system failed to give a single party absolute majority in parliament. The system used in Sunday's poll gave the leading party bonus seats depending on voter support. New Democracy won more than 40% of the vote, giving it 158 of the 300 seats in Greece's parliament. The big loser of the night was Syriza. The radical leftist party, which ran the country until 2019, lost more than 30 MPs. Meanwhile, an anti-immigrant party calling themselves the Spartans looks set to win up to 13 seats. Thousands of Israelis took to the streets of Tel Aviv in protest against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's proposed overhaul of the judicial system, raising concerns over potential implications for the country's judiciary independence. Israeli lawmakers on Sunday began debating a proposed judicial overhaul that has sparked mass protests. It would limit the Supreme Court's powers and is instigated by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's religious nationalist coalition. Sunday's step reboots a drive Netanyahu suspended in March after months of huge protests. On Saturday night, tens of thousands of Israelis opposed to the bill blocked a major Tel Aviv highway. Netanyahu declared last week that compromise talks with opposition parties had been fruitless and ordered some of the legislation to be revived. Coalition lawmakers have indicated that the new bill would be much softer than the previous proposals, which sought to almost totally roll back the Supreme Court's power to rule against the executive. But critics see it as an attempt to curb court independence by Netanyahu, who is on trial on graft charges that he denies. Opposition leader Yair Lapid on Twitter urged Netanyahu to stop the legislation and revive negotiations until, quote, we reach agreements that will safeguard democracy and prevent a national disaster. The proposed judicial changes have also stirred Western concern over Israel's democratic health and spooked investors. 
Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Days of heavy rainfall swell Chile's rivers, causing deadly floods as the country sees the worst weather front in a decade, which prompted the authority to declare a state of catastrophe in several regions. Chile is facing the worst weather front in a decade, officials say, as towns across the country are flooded by overflowing rivers, including the main Mapocho River in Santiago, after days of rainfall. The flooding around the city's main waterway has cut off routes leading towards the Pacific Ocean, hitting families who live on its banks and leaving small towns isolated. Authorities said on Saturday at least two people had died, three were missing and hundreds had lost their homes. Kayaks and helicopters were deployed to extract victims who were trapped. Chilean President Gabriel Boric visited one of the affected regions. Climate change drives increasingly extreme weather. The recent downpour in Chile comes just a few months after the devastating wildfires amid a severe drought. The fires destroyed hundreds of homes and left dozens of people dead. While Chile is drowning in floods, a record-breaking heat wave is entering its third week in Texas as temperatures reach triple digits in the broader U.S. South and tens of thousands of people in affected states are without power and lack air conditioning. More than 40 million people in the U.S. are under a heat alert. Let's take a look. There's a threat of a tornado outbreak, with one being spotted just south of Indianapolis. It comes with temperatures in the south hitting historic triple digits for the third week in a row. Some spots reaching more than a scorching 110 degrees. More than 40 million Americans are under heat alerts during an unrelenting heat wave that's now turning deadly. At Big Bend National Park, officials say a 14-year-old boy died after passing out while hiking in 119 degree heat. The boy's stepfather, racing to get help, was tragically killed in a car crash, according to the National Park Service. Both deaths are under investigation. We have multiple patients. And in Houston, a dozen people trying to cool off from the brutal heat were rushed to the hospital Saturday after getting sick at a lazy river pool from possible chlorine poisoning. There's several children having trouble breathing in a who ingested chlorine. The facility declined to comment. Now, with more blistering heat on the way, the Texas power grid is being pushed to its limits. Its operator, ERCOT, issuing a weather watch all the way through Friday, bracing for record-breaking demand. As people try to beat the heat any way they can. Now, the U.S. Coast Guard held a press briefing to bring closure to the search and rescue phase of the response to the Titan submersible, which officially concluded after debris was discovered near the Titanic wreckage. The U.S. Coast Guard says the Titan submersible search and rescue efforts are officially over. Now, the Coast Guard says it's convened a Marine Board of Investigation, working with international partners to figure out what went wrong, killing all five men on board Titan. The board will first and primarily work to determine the cause of this marine casualty and the five associated deaths. And it can make recommendations to the proper authorities to pursue civil or criminal sanctions as necessary. The military discussing the cost of its efforts too. The Coast Guard doesn't charge for search and rescue, nor do we associate a cost with human life. We always answer the call. OceanGate spokesperson tells the company has, quote, no additional information to share at this time. Also new tonight, a closer look at the ongoing recovery operation. Pelagic Research Services sharing these photos of its remotely operated vehicle Odysseus from today's dive. The company calling the efforts remarkably difficult and risky, challenged by incredible atmospheric pressures, temperatures and environmental stresses. Titan went missing last Sunday on its descent to the Titanic shipwreck. On Thursday, officials announced the discovery of submersible debris near Titanic's bow, saying the submersible's exploration appears to have ended in a catastrophic implosion. 
Now, investigators are looking into voice recordings from Titan's mothership with the submersible's experimental design coming under growing scrutiny. Still no definitive answer on how adventure became tragedy. Now, despite overall inflation seemingly easing, food prices in South Korea continue to surge, prompting the government to urge companies to reduce prices. Trips to the supermarket are putting a dent in consumers' wallets as food prices continue to rise. According to Statistics Korea Monday, prices of ramen during the first quarter of 2023 surged more than 12 percent, the highest in 15 years since the 2008 global financial crisis. In September last year, South Korea's number one instant noodle company by sales, Nongshim, raised its prices by more than 11 percent. This was followed by price hikes that reached nearly 10 percent for another major instant noodle maker, Palto, and 11 percent for Otugi just one month later. And with international wheat prices now around 50 percent lower than they were when those companies hiked prices, Finance Minister Chu kyung appeared on TV screens last week where he urged ramen companies to lower instant noodle prices. Consumers have also begun to voice their complaints as ramen in South Korea is considered to be an affordable staple food. But the increase in food prices has already surpassed the increase in disposable income during the first quarter. Data from Statistics Korea shows that average monthly disposable income rose 3.4 percent compared to the 12 percent rise in consumer prices of ramen. Other affordable supermarket items such as snack foods surged more than 13 percent and ice cream nearly 12 percent over the same period. The rise in the price of ice cream is also the highest since the second quarter of 2009. The price increase for bread fell slightly but remained high at 14.3 percent in the first quarter after passing 15 percent during the first quarter of last year. And with lower grain prices apparently not yet impacting prices on the shelves, consumers will be hoping for cheaper staple food items in the second half of the year. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. One person has been killed and several injured in a roller coaster accident at the Grönland amusement park in the Swedish capital Stockholm, where the ride came partly off the rails. The jetline roller coaster reaches a height of 30 meters and a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. Opec expects global oil demand to rise to 110 million barrels per day by 2045, its secretary general said during an energy conference. This number is 23 percent higher than current levels, and he added that in spite of other energy sources such as gas and hydrogen expanding, oil will remain an integral part of the mix. Achieving Net zero emissions targets would not come at the expense of economic growth or vice versa, Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim said, as affordability and energy security remain key concerns for the region of more than half a billion people. The Australian government will provide a new $73.5 million package to Ukraine, including 70 military vehicles to defend against Russia's invasion, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has said. Smoke from wildfires in Canada shrouded the city of Montreal in smog, leading to several event cancellations of the city clinching the most polluted air in the world. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we take a look at streets in one downtown Tokyo neighborhood that are broken by joggers, parents with children in strollers and a pair of alpacas out for their daily walk. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.